better men for United you this year. <laughs> <laughs> I use the vice president. Are you a senior white house official? Are you John oh. Kirby? <laughs> <laughs> Where's your wife? <laughs> I think thumbs up, thumbs up, two thumbs up from the bunny. Yay. Nice. Thank you. Bye. Happy Easter. <laughs> oh, hello, everybody. Happy Easter Monday. Um, so I have something at the top for all of you. I think you'll be really interested in this. So President Biden is scheduled to announce he is revoking the Hatch Act. So as a gift to all of you, so now I can actually take all your questions about 2024. No? I thought you would love that. All right, okay. April Fools, April Fools, April Fools. It is April 1st. I thank you. I thought that was pretty, I thought it was pretty slick with me. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> With all, in all seriousness, a couple things at the top. So First Lady Jill Biden, Dr. Biden, a teacher for more than 30 years, is continuing her theme of education for today's White House Easter egg roll, transforming the South Lawn and Ellipse into a school community full of fun educational activities for children of all ages to enjoy. In total, <laughs> approximately 40,000 people will take part in this year's event, 40,000 people. We, we do want to say a special thank you to the American Egg Board and America's Egg Farmers for continuing its more than 45-year history of support for the event and for its donation of 64,000 eggs used on the South Lawn and another 64,000 donated to the Capital Area Food Bank to match the eggs used for the roll. And I have some news for you at the top. I know many of you are asking this question over the weekend. President Biden will travel to Baltimore on Friday to visit the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge, meet with state and local officials, and get on the ground, uh, on the ground look at federal response efforts. The president is continuing to lead a whole of government approach to the collapse. President Biden and his team are working with Governor Moore, the congressional delegation, Mayor Scott, and numerous state and local of officials to reopen the port, rebuild the bridge, and support the people of Baltimore. Through the unified command, the U.S. Coast Guard is coordinating a complex and highly coordinated effort to remove the, record, the wreckage with resources from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the state of Maryland, and others. Crane barges are on the scene supporting the mission. In addition, the Chesapeake 1000, the largest heavy lift uh, crane barge on the East Coast, which is nearly 200 feet long and can lift 1,000 tons, arrived Thursday night. And on Saturday, the Unified Command successfully removed the first piece of wreckage. Last week, within hours of receiving the request, the U.S. Department of Transportation announced the immediate availability of $60 million in quick release, emergency relief fund for the Maryland Department of Transportation. We're also doing everything that we can to help address economic impacts on Saturday. The Small Business Administration quickly approved a disaster declaration and will provide low-interest disaster loans to eligible affected business businesses today. The SBA is launching two business recovery centers in Baltimore County. These centers will support impacted business owners in, com in completing their disaster loan applications. The Department of Labor is working with local and state officials to determine how to assist workers out of, uh, out of work due to closure of the port. Acting Secretary of Labor Julie Su is in Baltimore today meeting with stakeholders and twice last week, the White House convened a meeting for the Biden-Harris Administration Supply Chain Disruptors Task Force to discuss potential impacts on regional and national supply chains. As the president said, within hours of the collapse, this administration will be with the people of Baltimore every step of the way. We are with you, Baltimore, and we will be there uh, until, until we get this done. 
air, land, and sea, like flying by we will have Wonder. more. We will have more information as we get closer to, to Friday. I think the important thing is the president has said we just he was going to go as soon as possible. Now he's uh, he is going to go on Friday. We certainly will have more information to share. I just don't have any details at this time. Okay, well. Thank you. Uh, so the criticism over the transgender day of visibility, um, the White House said that the president uh, wouldn't abuse his faith for political purposes. Does the president think that's what Republicans are doing? On I mean, look, uh, just a couple of things. And uh, really um, so surprised by the misinformation that's been out there around this. And I want to be very clear, every year for the past several years, on March 31st, Trans Transgender Day of Visibility is marked. And as we know, for folks who understand the calendar and how it works, Easter falls on different Sundays, right? Every year. And this year, it happened to coincide with Trans uh, Transgender Visibility Day. And so that is the simple fact. That is what has happened. That is where we are. And I do want to say a couple of things because I think it's important here, uh, as you just stated in your questions, what we've been hearing out there, a lot of misinformation done on purpose. Uh, and as a Christian uh, who celebrates Easter with family, President Biden stands for bringing people together and upholding the dignity and freedoms of every American. Now, sadly, and it's not surprising, right? It is actually unsurprising that politicians are seeking to divide and weaken our country with cruel, hateful, and dishonest rhetoric. It is dishonest what we have heard the past 24 hours. It is untrue what we heard over the weekend. And, um, you know, we, we were at first, uh, want to be very clear, confused. Uh, on their coverage. Uh, we're grateful that Fox agrees with President Biden about the importance of recognizing Trans Day of Visibility. And I'll just quote something that Fox said uh, back in 2021. They tweeted this, Trans Day of Visibility is dedicated to celebrating transgender people. To all the transgender men, women, and non-binary folk, we see you and stand with you. President Biden will never abuse his faith or for political purposes or for profit. That is not what this administration is about. That is not what being a leader is about. And this misinformation out there is just, it's just, it's bad. And it is dividing, it is cost to divide us. And I wanna say one more quote. Uh, this is uh, what political covered every year. And I said this at the top of my answer, Transgender Day of Visibility is on March 31st. This year, March 31st, just so happens to be also Easter the date of which changes every year. That's how I started out, and that's how I end. Thank you. Thanks, Green. Why are the U.S. and Israelis <laughs> meeting virtually today instead of having that in-person meeting on Rafa? So, as you know, I can confirm that there is a virtual me meeting happening today with both uh, U.S. official, Israeli officials, uh, to discuss Rafa, uh, uh, the situation in Rafa, and um, obviously the next steps that we have been hearing that the Israeli government wants to take. Uh, this is this is following the discussions that we we all talked about last week with the uh, Israeli Minister of Defense and his delegation, uh, and this conversation today is being led by National Security Advisor uh, Jake Sullivan. Look, I think it's important to note that we were, re we were able to reschedule this on Friday, and we wanted to move very quickly on this, and today it, they, the meeting is happening virtually because we understand, and obviously you all understand, how important it is to have uh, this conversation. We have been very clear about our concerns about a military operation in Rafah. We know that there are more than a million uh, Palestinians who are in Rafah right now who moved from the north uh, to go into Rafah. And so we want to make sure if there is going to be a military operation. We also know that there are Hamas operators in Rafah as well. But if they are going to move forward with a military operation, we have to have this conversation. Uh, we have to understand how they're going to move forward. We, and I'll say one more thing, when Jake Sullivan was here at the podium, uh, not too long ago, he believed and he said there are alternative alternative ways of doing this, alternative ways of going after Hamas. And so they're going to have the discussion. I think it's important that it happen as quickly as, as it did, even though it's virtual, and we'll certainly have more to share. Are there still in-person meetings planned, and if so, we, when? We will have more to share on the next steps. We're going to have a readout of this conversation, but I think 
rescheduled on Friday. Today, Monday, we're having a conversation. We, we have laid out our concerns about this for some time, and I think it's important uh, that both sides are, are having this discussion. And just lastly, Speaker Johnson said there would be a vote on Ukraine soon when the House comes back from recess, but he said it would include some innovations, like making some portion of it a loan. If that's the only way to get Ukraine aid passed, would the president sign that kind of bill? I'm not going to get into hypo hypotheticals here. We've been very clear. We believe that the speaker were to put the national security supplemental on the floor, obviously it includes Ukraine, humanitarian aid, Israel, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we believe, and it is fact, uh, that uh, it would get majority uh, bipartisan support on, on the floor in the House. We saw 70 to 29, it passed out of the Senate. Bipartisan support, overwhelming bipartisan support. We believe it would get overwhelming bipartisan support if he would put it on the floor. That's all he needs to do. And so that's what we believe the, the speaker, how it should be moved forward. I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals. Did you expect specific decisions to come out of the Rafa meeting today? Karina? I'm not going to get ahead of the meeting. We will have a readout of, uh, of, of that meeting. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to get ahead of it. The, the Israelis bombed Iran's consulate building in Damascus today, apparently killed an Iranian military commander. Did you know about this in advance? Are you concerned this is an escalation? So look, I'm aware of the reports. Our team is looking into it, so I'm not going to get ahead of, of anything just yet. But obviously, we're aware of the reports, and our team is looking into it. I'm just not going to go beyond that. Actually, if I could, uh, do you have an update on how to pay for the new bridge? Have you, have you had conversations with House Republicans about this? So as, as I mentioned at the top, um, we uh, De Department of Transportation was able to uh, release 16, 16 million dollars, which uh, obviously is going to be really important, uh, a kind of a down payment, if you will, on getting uh, on dealing on on getting that bridge rebuilt. Uh, we're going to have continued conversation with the state of Maryland uh, to get a sense of how much uh, this is going to cost. And we have said uh, we're going to uh, certainly continue to talk to Congress uh, to get some assistance here. The president has been very clear. He's going to be there for the people of Baltimore. This is a whole of government approach, uh, and we are going to do everything that we can uh, to make sure that that bridge gets back up. Uh, I don't have anything further to share on congressional uh, conversation, but that's a commitment that the president has made. Okay. Thanks, Green. Uh, 60 Minutes reported last night on a connection between anomalous health incidents and a unit of the Russian uh, military intelligence service. What's the White House? Uh, reaction to that report. So I'm going to be really careful here. Uh, the intelligence community has not concluded that. Uh, obviously, there was an assessment that the intelligence community made, and so I would have to refer you to the to uh, ODNI on their assessment. But that particular piece about Russia, uh, I know that they had not concluded that. Right, uh, and I, I know that the the intelligence community has uh, <coughs> said that it's they still think it's un not likely that uh, a foreign power is responsible. How can the administration continue to believe that when you have so many credible U.S. officials who have experienced this saying otherwise? So look, this is an intel intelligence community assessment. Odie and I can speak specifically on how they got to that assessment, how they got to that conclusion, so I want to be super mindful. What I can speak to is what we have done since 2023, since the Intelligence uh, Committee assessment, uh, and we have taken this very seriously. The President takes U.S. personnel, uh, making sure that they are protected is the most important. A couple of te steps that we took, we prioritized investigations into the cause of AH AHIs and to examine reports thoroughly. Now, this is something that the President directed the departments in the federal government, obviously across the federal government, to do ensure that U.S. government personnel and their families who report AHIs receive the support and timely access to medical care that they need, and, and uh, to take reports of AHIs seriously and, and, and threat to personnel with respect and compassion. So we have taken some actions that, will, uh, that, um, that the President directed his agencies across the federal government. At any specifics to the intelligence assessment, I would have to refer you to ODNI. And yet the Pentagon confirmed another aspect of 60 Minutes reporting today that a, uh, a Department of Defense official who was in Vilnius for the NATO summit last year also experienced what appears to be <coughs> AHI. Can you give us any update on that person's so, condition? I don't have any update. I, I'm very careful about speaking to any personnel. Um, 
a specific case, so I can't. I don't want to do that from here. Uh, I would have to refer you on Department of Defense since that came from the Department of Defense. Bottom line, are U.S. officials who are working on issues related to Russia, particularly overseas, are they safe? Look. We are going to continue to emphasize the importance of prioritizing, right, making sure that personnel uh, are, you know, protected, uh, and we are going to do everything that we can. This is something that this president uh, believes is, is important. Uh, and so, look, we're going to get to the, we're going to continue to do a comprehensive examine, examination of the effects here that we're seeing and the potential causes of AHI. That's something that we're going to continue to look into. And look, we take this very seriously. We take this very serious. This is why we have taken an all government approach and, and have directed agencies uh, to do the, the three things that I listed it out uh, and um, you know it, it this is this is important we see this as a as a, uh, as a important uh, issue that we want to to certainly uh, prioritize and that's what we have been doing since 2023 yeah, thank you is the president hosting an NSCAR dinner tomorrow so I don't have anything to confirm uh, here. Uh, as you know, uh, very early on this month, we put out a statement uh, marking the first day of uh, Ramadan. Uh, this is March, obviously we did that. The President wishes all who observe uh, Ramadan a safe, healthy, and blessed month. In his statement, he spoke to the appalling resurgence of hate and violence towards Muslim Americans. He also spoke to the need to secure a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal in our efforts to significantly increase humanitarian aid into Gaza. And that's something that you've heard us talk about. You've heard us actually take actions in the past couple of weeks, whether it's the pier, whether it's the plane drop, and working with Israel, obviously, to get uh, that, uh, uh, in increase the humanitarian aid. And so we're going to continue to do that. Uh, we don't have, I don't have anything to uh, to share with you at this moment. Our dinner, would you announce that in advance the way you do for Hanukkah gatherings or I, I other I just don't have gatherings. anything to share on, on, on an event, an upcoming event at this time. I just don't have anything to share. On LNG and Ukraine aid, can you say, is the president open to suspending the pause on the administration's pause on, on new LNG approvals in exchange for Ukraine aid? So as we said repeatedly, the House uh, needs to pass the bipartisan national security supplemental. I've been saying that. I said it was the first thing I said uh, when I came to the podium, one of the first things. Uh, and we want to see that as soon as possible. We know it would get bipartisan support uh, overwhelmingly if it were to go to the floor in the House. That's what we want to see. Uh, as I stated, it's already passed the Senate, 7029. So it's important to move forward. And we've also talked about, Jake Sullivan has talked about, my National Security Council uh, colleague has talked about this as well well is that we or Ukraine can't afford any more delays. We have seen what's been happening the past several weeks, the past several months in Ukraine. They are losing ground on the battlefield. Sorry, it's still on the table. Well what I'm saying is that we have to pass the bipartisan national security supplemental. That's what we want to see. If we want to is, is willing we, to uh, look, make that, that exchange. This is this is where we are at this moment in time. We want to make sure that national security supplemental is moved forward. It could get bipartisan support. We know it will. We know it would get overwhelming support if they put it on the floor, right? And con Congress's inaction has led to Ukraine losing footing in the battlefield. That's what we've seen. That's what we've seen. And so Congress needs to act. It is in order to actually deal with this, in order to give Ukraine, the Ukrainians, what they need, the brave Ukrainians on the ground, so what they need. I'm just not going to negotiate from the podium. That's what we, we've always been very clear from that, from here. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. We know what needs to be done. And what needs to be done is to put that national security supplemental passed out of the Senate in a bipartisan fashion, 70 to 29. We believe it can get passed overwhelmingly in a bipartisan fashion in the House. I just want to be mindful and not get into hypotheticals from here. Um, on the reporting about the health incidents, because a lot of these um, concerns and incidents are happening on the president's and vice president's trip, do you know if the president or vice president have met with anyone who's been impacted by any of these health no, concerns? No, it's a good question. Don't have uh, don't have any readout or any conversations uh, to to say or to speak to at this time. And then these officials are saying they're speaking out because they don't agree with the ODNI assessment. Is the president going to you know implore Director Haynes to look at these claims more closely? I mean, there was a. a, 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 a um, 
an assessment that was done, as you just stated in your in your statement, in your question to me, I would have to, uh, we trust our, our intelligence community, right? Uh, and they put out an assessment, so I would have to refer you to ODN. I can't get into any spe more specifics. So the president is standing by that assessment. That's the end of the road. He's standing by the assessment. I would have to refer you to ODNI. Okay. Karina, I have um, two different subjects related to this <coughs> one topic. Um, when it comes to the bottom report, is the president or Democrat, or are you hearing from Democrats, particularly in this building, that um, there's a concern that Republicans aren't moving uh, in an expeditious fashion? Look, uh I can't, I can't speak to that right now. What I can speak to, what the president has been doing, he has said he's going to use a whole of government uh, approach. Uh, you heard the Department of Transportation, you heard me at the top say that $60 million has been provided to get that bridge uh, done. And uh, look, we're going to do everything that we can uh, to get the port open as soon as possible, obviously uh, to build that bridge as, as soon as possible. The timeline is going to be complicated. It is a complicated uh, scenario, so I don't have a timeline on that. Uh, look, we're going to have conversations with congressional members. Uh, we're going to uh, certainly talk to them on what else is needed. Uh, if there is additional funding, there is going to be additional funding needed uh, to get this done. I'm not going to go into, into specifics at this time. Are Republicans invited to the White House to speak for next week to talk about this? I don't have any uh, schedule uh, about um, uh, any congressional conversations here happening at the White House, but I would say the, you know, our, um, our, our ledge affairs, uh, White House Ledge Affairs has regular communication with uh, with uh, with congressional members. Department of Transportation as well has regular communication with congressional members, and so that's going to continue. I just don't have a a a formal a formal meeting to be happening here on this particular issue. And the next subject that's related to this, after all of us, the world watched how that cargo ship, that multi hundred ton barge, ran into the pillar. Is there a concern about assessing um, bridges um, that deal with these kind of things around the nation? Has there been talk about that? Because this was, yes, it was catastrophic, but this government seems to be very reactionary. When something happens, it jumps on uh, to try to fix it. Which I think is a good thing. I think when something happens, the fact that this administration jumps on top of it and tries to make sure that uh, we don't forget the communities, we assist, uh, and we get uh, communities put back together, right? The, the bridge is, is something that the Balta people of Baltimore are feeling very uh, acutely. And so we're going to certainly do everything that we can to get that bridge back up and to get the port open. Look, but as you're asking me about bridges and, and certainly infrastructure, uh, no, but that's why the bipartisan infrastructure legislation was so important. Let's not forget that infrastructure law is now going to really deal uh, with infrastructure in a generation. <laughs> it is something that is a, an investment in our infrastructure, not just bridges. We're talking about tunnels. We're talking about roads, right? We're talking about broadband, right? These are incredibly important and creating jobs, creating good paying union jobs. Uh, and so that is what the president has said he was going to do. The last administration turned it into a joke. It was infrastructure week every week, and he did absolutely nothing. And so this administration was able to get a bipartisan infrastructure law done. And so we are, we are proud to have been able to do that. Obviously, it's going to speak to the bridges. It's going to speak to, bridge, uh, to, uh, to roads and tunnels. And I think that's important that that was able to get done uh, within the president's first term. Okay. Thank you, Karin. Um, international doctors has been describing horrific scene at the Shifa Hospital where 300 bodies were found. Some were tied up and executed, including doctors, women, and children. Is the White House calling for an independent investigation? Um, and second, do you believe that Israel is in violation of international law? And just on another topic, the Israeli Knesset, the parliament, just passed a law banning international media from working in Israel. You always call Israel as an ally that you should value with. Is this a value that you share with? So a couple, you asked me two very important questions and I want to get to, to them. So as it relates to, and I, I think you're speaking uh, specifically, at least the reports that we've seen is about Al Jazeera, Zero specifically, but it doesn't matter whichever, right, journalist more broadly. Uh, but at, to those particular report, uh, we've seen the reports and certainly I'm going to refer to Israel for what they may or may not be considering. But uh, it is, if it is true, if it is true, uh, a move like this is concerning. 
We believe in the freedom of the press. It is critical. It is critically important, and the United States supports the critically important work journalists around the world do. And so, and that includes those who are reporting in, uh, in the conflict in Gaza. So we believe that work is important, the freedom of the press is important, and if those reports are true, it is concerning to us. Uh, and to your first question, uh, so look, Hamas should not, uh, should not be operating out of hospitals. We have said that. We've said that over and over again. Uh, and putting civilians at risk. That's what we're seeing. And we are concerned by how Hamas appears. It, they appear to have been able to reconstitute in a hospital uh, so quickly. So we've always ma also made clear that we continue to support Israel's right to defend itself. But, but as we've also said, we do not want firefights uh, in a hospital where innocent people, uh, people, helpless people, people seeking medical care are caught in, in a crossfire. We don't want to see that. Uh, we have urged Israel to take every step to avoid civilian casualties, and this just points to how challenging Israel's military operation is because Hamas has intentionally embedded themselves into, into civilian infrastructure, into these hospitals. And so, uh, and so we've been very clear as, as it relates to the footage, as it relates to the photos and reportings, we have not verified that photo, footage. We're, we're, gonna, we're reaching out uh, to the Israeli uh, government to get more information. But obviously, if these reports are true, that is indeed deeply concerning. The difference between the civilized world and uncivilized world is sticking to international law at the time of war. So. Regardless, even if these people were Hamas, do you believe that under international law, Israel has the right to execute people, even if Hamas, which you consider a terrorist organization, regardless, you can't hold them to the same standard as a professional army that often the White House prays as a professional army, they know what they're doing. And even sometimes you said, I wish the US Army behaved like the Israelis. I hear your question, and I have said it is deeply concerning if it's true. We are reaching out to Israel uh, government to get more information. Uh, and that is also important to do. We have to make sure that these, this, what we're hearing uh, is verified, right? That w the footage is also uh, verified. But we've been very clear. Like this is, we also have to call out Hamas here. They are operating uh, out of hospitals, out of hospitals. That's what they're doing. They're embedding themselves in civilian population. This is what they're doing. Uh, and so we have to be also very clear about that. And we have said we've urged Israel to take every step that they uh, to avoid uh, civilian casualties. So we're going to we're going to reach out to the Israeli government, get more information on that. And it, if is, if that is indeed the case, it is deeply concerning. It is deeply concerning. Um, thanks, Crane. Just kind of going back to the LNG pause for a minute. Uh, in January, when the pause was announced, the president put out a statement, and he said. This pause on oil <coughs> and approvals sees the climate crisis for what it is, the existential threat of our time. Does the president still believe that that LNG pause is so necessary? Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in our, in our, in our posture on LNG. Okay. <laughs> Great, listen. Okay. Good job. Thanks, Kareem. Back in 2007, there was another deadly bridge collapse. It happened in Minnesota. And days after Congress reacted, they passed the funding uh, to replace that bridge. Is the president disappointed that there isn't that same sense of urgency as it relates to the key bridge in Baltimore? So look, what I can speak to right now in this time, in this moment, is the, what, what the president has promised. A whole of government approach here, uh, response, that's what you've seen. Uh, the Department of Transportation was able to provide 70, $60 million just last week. They made that announcement. Uh, you heard me talk about that at the top. And we will, of course, of course, we are going to work with Congress to ensure uh, that we have the, the resources, right, needed uh, so that we can make sure that this is fully covered, the rebuilding of the bridge is fully covered. Uh, I'm not going to go beyond, uh, beyond that. We're going to have those conversations. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we are there for the people of Baltimore. That is the President's uh, promise. He said that the federal government is going to fully pay for that, uh, and he's going to stand by his word. Thank you, Karim. Um, also about Baltimore, uh, the six victims of the collapse of the bridge were Latino mm -hmm. from Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Is the president planning to meet with the families of the victims? And more broadly, what the White House is doing to help these families that now are facing difficult decisions, for example, where to hold a funeral? Because some of the family members cannot leave to their home country, mm -hmm. some others cannot come here. So yeah. what are you doing with all that? So, um, 
gonna, going to give you more about what the president's going to be doing on Friday in the next upcoming days. We'll have more details to share to all of you. Uh, and so I'll leave it there about what uh, what uh, what we're going to be doing on that day. Uh, as it relates to the family members, you uh, may have heard Tom Perez last week met with a couple of the family members. When he was in Baltimore, he did a press conference and talked about that and laid that out. Uh, so certainly we've been in touch with the family members. Uh, I just want to be super careful. Um, and, you know, they are mourning at this time. And so I just don't want to go beyond that. Is the White House considering some kind of parole to let the people come? I don't have anything beyond beyond that. Okay. Just a couple more on Baltimore. Um, you went into it a little bit at the top, but what does the president hope to get out of the visit on Friday? Like, what does he want to see and yeah. what does he want to hear when he's there? So, look, uh, I, you know, uh, sadly, he, he's done these kind of um, uh, kind of visits, not obviously uh, not this dramatic with a bridge before, but he has been there for communities when they've experienced a traumatic uh, event like the people of Baltimore have. And I think it's important for him, for, for, uh, for people to, for, for folks who are working on the ground, whether it's the first responders who were there in the first couple of hours or the folks who are there now, to see from, from to see the president, to hear from the commander in chief, to know that he appreciates the work that they've been doing around the clock, to also be there for the community. You know, we've seen Governor Moore, we've seen the mayor uh, do everything that they can for the community in this time. And so the president wants to be there as well. He's going to be, Governor Moore is going to be joining him. I can share, share that with all of you, and certainly we'll have more beyond that. Um, and so I think it's important for when, when something like this, when something this traumatic, six people died, a community is affected uh, by this bridge, uh, to have the president be there. Uh, and so we know that there's a whole of government approach happening here, a response. Uh, and, uh, and so the president's going to see for himself uh, what happened, uh, see for himself the work that's being done. Uh, I don't want to get ahead uh, of what that's going to look like. I know I was asked if he's going to do it by air or land. I just don't have any details at this time. And see. True, and see, uh, we'll have more details to share if the family members are going to be there. We just have more detail to share. Obviously, he'll be there with Governor Moore, and he will assess himself and see for himself and hear directly uh, from uh, from the people who are on the ground doing the work. And Governor Moore and Mayor Scott were facing personal attacks in the wake of the bridge collapse last week. When was the last time the president talked to them, and did they talk about that? What's the White House response to so that? So, look, I, I think. Governor Moore said it perfectly on Sunday. We do not have time for this foolishness. We just don't. We don't have time for this foolishness. And uh, yeah. our focus is reopening the port, making sure that bridge uh, gets rebuilt, uh, making sure that we are there. We are there for the people of Baltimore. And so I will add that these claims are baseless and they're just wrong. They're just wrong. And uh, we're not going to let uh, these misinformation, disinformation, uh, these horrible statements that are being made distract us from the work that the people of Baltimore want us to do. And so uh, we just have no time for, for any of this foolishness. Uh, and that is, I think, the best way that could be said by, uh, by the gov Governor Moore, who said this yesterday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm referring, I mean, Karen could speak to her question, uh, but they've been under attack. There was the DEI comment on the mayor. Uh, there's been other uh, really misguided, misinformed, just awful, awful statements that have been made. And those are wrong. And those are baseless. And we cannot be distracted here. Are there racist statements? Look, I, what I can say is they're wrong and they're baseless. And I think that that's pretty... That goes pretty far, right? And let's not forget, six people, six people lost their lives. Six people lost their lives. Yeah, Jared. As um, you have these conversations with Congress about the funding needed to reopen the port and, and reopen, rebuild the bridge, are there also <coughs> conversations about any additional legislation that may be needed as it relates to like regulation or oversight? So look, I, I'm not gonna uh, get into, um, I'm not going to get ahead of the funding conversations here that we're having. Uh, and I think that's what is the focus here right now, is to make sure that we have the funding, uh, that we get that bridge built, make sure that we open that port. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, just don't want to get into, not going to get ahead. Uh, as you know, there's an investigation happening, so don't want to get ahead of that. Uh, does the president support the $20 minimum wage uh, that's going into effect for fast food workers in California today? 
Let me look into that. I have not seen that, that reporting. Obviously, the president believes that every worker uh, should be paid. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, should be able to, to be able to be paid to, to, to support their family. And we hear you hear the, the president talk about uh, making sure that, uh, you know, folks are able to live in dignity, right, and respect, have that dignity and respect to raise their family. You hear the president talk about his own experience growing up and how difficult it is to be when you're around that, uh, when you're around the kitchen table making those difficult decisions. On this particular report, I just, I don't want to speak, speak, in, uh, speak about it until I get more, more information. Okay. Um, and going back to the LNG export ban, the Energy Secretary has said that that's a temporary pause. I'm wondering how long temporary is, and if it is to the level that <coughs> that was read out earlier, you know, related to the climate crisis, are there plans to make it permanent? I would refer you to the Department of Energy. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, starting with Turkey, can you just tell us a little bit more about the Turkish president's visit next month? What priorities the two presidents bring to this meeting? Yeah, we'll have we'll have more to share as we get closer uh, to that uh, to that date. Uh, don't want to get ahead of obviously what's actually going to happen in the meeting, but certainly uh, we'll have more to share. Well, then I'll move on to uh, a Chinese national was arrested for trespassing on a California naval base. Does this speak to larger concerns that the White House has about? Um, possible Chinese spying, uh, national security, and what are you doing about this? So look, we take those types of uh, incidents very seriously. Uh, I can't speak to case, case by case, but obviously that's something that we take very seriously. We work uh, with folks on the ground when we see those types of cases pop up, but I just don't, and I just don't want to get too, further, too, too far into it. Finally, on Senegal, the President and the Secretary of State <coughs> congratulated the new President, the 44-year-old President. Um, this is leading to other societies in West Africa pushing for quicker elections, mm -hmm. um, for a loosening of their entrenched leadership. How does the White House see that, and is that something that you support? Say that last part, it, it, it relates to? Uh, uh, sorry, um, we're seeing now that other countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, to name just two, um, their citizenry are now pushing for democratic transitions. Is that something you guys support? What are you doing to support that? I think it's important, right? Free and fair elections, uh, democracy working at its best in this in this regard. I think it's incredibly important. Uh, I, that is, you know, that is something for each individual uh, domestic uh, country to uh, decide on, uh, on, but I think it's important to have free and fair elections, let the civilians, let the people decide uh, who's going to represent them. I mean, that's something that we have said multiple times on every election. Will the president post his new Senegalese counterpart? <laughs> I don't have a, a call to read out or anything to speak to at this point. Thanks, Kareem. Most of the border crossers accused of beating up Texas National Guardsmen in a riot last month were released on their own recognizance Sunday. How does that make people in this country any safer? So I have to refer you to Department of Justice and DHS on that uh, uh, particular um, uh, reporting. Uh, I will say this, uh, as the event unfolded, uh, the Border Patrol was able to act quickly and get the situation under control and apprehend the migrants. And we were grateful that the Border Patrol was able to do their job. Look, there is a challenge at the border, right? Our immigration system has been broken for decades, before, even before this president became president, obviously, three years, more than three years ago. And this president, a couple months ago, worked with the Senate in a bipartisan fashion to get a negotiation done, right? And what we saw is from the last president, President Trump, told Republicans in Congress not to move forward with this negotiation, this agreed negotiation, this agreed plan, this agreed proposal, because it would help Joe Biden. That's what was reported by some of you. And we can actually deal with this. We can actually deal with, with what we're seeing. And because they didn't move forward, right, because they didn't move forward with this proposal, because of the last president and because they, they put politics in ha ahead of the American people, we are seeing chaos. And so we want to get this done. We did. We worked with Congress to get this done, to deal with the challenges at the border. President Trump got in the way, and because President Trump got in the way, Republicans are now getting in the way. So does President Biden wish that Republicans in Congress would help him make a law that made it easier to deport people? What the president wants to see is he wants congressional Republicans to pass, to move forward with a bipartisan border security agreement a bipartisan border security agreement that was supported by the Border Patrol Union, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, something that we don't see nowadays. 
And we were able to get that done. What the president wants to see is that being passed. He wants congressional Republicans to not put politics first, to put majority of Americans want us to deal with this issue. That's what the president wants to see. Totally different topic. How worried do Americans need to be about squatters? About squatters? About squatters. There's a lot of stories out there. Homeowners are showing up at places that they own where the locks have been changed. Some squatter has moved in and the homeowner has no rights. Does President Biden think that is right? So if, if my understanding is that this is obviously uh, uh, a local issue. We are certainly tracking that issue. Uh, the rights of property owners and renters must be protected. And we believe that, uh, you know, ultimately, what needs to happen is the local uh, government needs to make sure that they address this and they take action. And so everyone in their community uh, in this country wants the same thing, right? They all want the same thing. They want their families to be safe. And that's what we want as well. We want to make sure that Americans and their families feel safe. In Florida, there's a new law where victims of squatting can call the cops and have the squatters removed. Would President Biden support something like that? I'm, I'm not going to get into into uh, into hypotheticals from here. Uh, what I can say is that uh, ultimately this is a local issue, and it is uh, critical that uh, that local governments take action to address it. Uh, again. Everybody wants the same thing. They want to feel safe in their communities. That's what they want. Uh, we certainly are tracking these stories. Hi. Uh, so last week when uh, Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg came, he talked about uh, the Baltimore Bridge collapse uh, will be affecting 8,000 workers. I was wondering if the White House had any plans for these workers. So I know that the Department of Labor, uh, the Acting Secretary, Julie Su, is certainly uh, working on top, is on top of this. Uh, so sir, uh, I would refer you to uh, the Department of Labor on what they're doing specifically uh, to make sure that workers uh, are certainly, um, uh, uh, are, are, you know, their, their needs are being addressed. Uh, but want to be really clear, we're taking all of this seriously, right? We're, we're taking, uh, this is a whole of government approach. And so Department of Labor has, has, has had uh, meetings with stakeholders as I said at the top, and looking into this and trying to figure out how we can be helpful here. I know I could do one more. Yeah, I have, go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to ask about Adil Mangi, who's nominated for a seat on the circuit court. Can you talk about what you all are doing specifically to get him confirmed after? Which, which, which? Mangi is his last name, okay. M-A-N-G-I. Um, there were three Democratic senators now who have said they won't vote for his confirmation. Are you all doing anything specific to change their minds? So, look, we, uh, um, I, I don't want to speak, speak specifically to members, but I have said this many times before. The president was very proud to nominate uh, Adil Manji, whose extraordinary qualifications and integrity are gaining him new backing each day. Uh, as well as retired circuit judge Timothy Lewis, who was appointed by President George H.W. Bush. That's somebody who has supported it. Uh, he is now being backed by nearly a dozen law enforcement organizers, as well as former New Jersey uh, attorney generals, attorney generals and uh, former U.S. attorneys who served under Republican and Democratic governors and presidents. He's also backed by the AFL C and CIO. Uh, we are doing everything that we can uh, to make sure that he gets through. Uh, this Senate should side uh, with qualities that make America exceptional, which Mr. Manji embodies, not the hateful forces that we're seeing uh, trying to, to force America into the past. And so we're going to continue uh, our, our office here. Uh, the president's going to continue to do everything that we can to get him through. We believe he's extraordinarily qualified. Uh, to, um, uh, for this position. The president is proud to have nominated him, and we're going to continue to do the work. Okay, Brian, you're the last one. Thanks a lot. On the Key Bridge in Baltimore, the Key Bridge collapse, and the impact that it's had on the Baltimore port, does President Biden want Americans to be prepared for any supply chain problems? Mm. So you heard us, you heard me at the top lay out the meet, some meetings that we were able to do. The task force met uh, a couple times last week. Uh, as you just stated, the port is, is one of the nation's largest, as, as you were alluding to, uh, shipping hubs and, and the Francis uh, Scott Bridge is critical to travel in the Northeast Corridor. So we have engaged in 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 intensively with industry, ocean carriers, ports, and labor unions to minimize disruption 
options as shipments are rerouted uh, while the, the port of Baltimore is closed to, to uh, ship traffic. So the Small Business Administrator, Administration has been quickly activated, obviously. I said this at the top. You have the Department of Labor uh, as well. Uh, this is a whole of government approach, the Department of Transportation. We had the U.S. Coast Guard uh, um, uh, Admiral here that was able to, who's running that effort, uh, obviously, to, uh, to deal with uh, the cleanup and what we're seeing uh, there um, uh, at, in Baltimore. And so we are going to be there for the people of Baltimore. That is what the president has said. We're going to be there every step of the way. You're going to see the president uh, on Friday. Uh, we'll have more details to share as we get closer to that day. Uh, but all a government approach, Small Business Administration, Department of Labor, Department of Transportation, we are going to be there for, uh, for the people of Baltimore. What's the president's current assessment on supply chain disruptions? Look, we're obviously going to be monitoring this. We're going to be looking closely into that. Uh, and that's why we have uh, activated, the President has made sure uh, that we're doing this in a, in a um, you know, in a strategic way, in a smart way, uh, and dealing with all the stakeholders uh, that's going to be affected by this. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow.